for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Julie Hoffman, Head of Travel and Hospitality Strategy at Adobe. On the show, we talk about customer experience and the combination of physical and digital, something that Julie calls fidgetal, a lot of major trends that are affecting the hospitality and travel industry, as well as new technology and the potential of future voice-based travel booking, which I can't wait for, as well as loads of other examples of how companies and brands are enhancing their marketing efforts in a world of travel and hospitality. And last but not least, we talk about the moment when she was eight years old of getting to follow her father, who was working on designing tools for enhancing blind rehabilitation centers and how that inspired her to do the work that she's doing today. Well, Julie, welcome to the show. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate it. I'm really excited today to share a little bit more about what I've been doing at Adobe. Let's start off and have you tell us a little bit more about your background and that role that you have now at Adobe. I've actually spent the last 18 years in Las Vegas working in travel hospitality for two of the major brands, MGM Resorts International and Caesars Entertainment. You may have heard of them. My focus was in all areas of e-commerce, digital marketing, and also customer loyalty. Most recently, I led the customer experience transformation for MGM Resorts, driving the vision and the roadmap with a focus on a shift to mobile to support the in-market experience. Now, as head of industry strategy for travel at Adobe, my role encompasses bringing almost 20 years of thought leadership and digital transformation knowledge to large brands such as Marriott, Southwest, and Hyatt. Overall, my goal is to help brands learn how to become an experienced business. Now, what does that look like? It means moving beyond kind of the transactional to more meaningful relationships with a customer aided by technology. And I think that's the sweet spot of everything I've been working on the culmination all of these years. And it's been interesting because I've been in Las Vegas. Interesting. Technology is definitely playing a bigger role, and online in particular, in how consumers are booking and researching travel today. But tell us a little bit more about what we should know in the travel and hospitality industry. So the era of experience is here. The way I like, like to look at it, it's a reality. Every day we work with companies that are transforming themselves around the idea that their value goes way beyond their products and into a total experience their customers have with their brand. The so-called experience economy, it's kind of been teased out since the 90s, has finally been realized. And ready or not, we're kind of all part of it. Also, consumer demand for digital is clear. So across the board, we know that it's critical, yet most brands are really hustling to catch up. There's only about 38% of travel brands who've said that they're actually committed to the integration of physical and digital, or fidgetal as we like to call it. And only 26% have actually carried out tests. So in a lot of ways, the data that travel brands gather from different sources remains unconnected, isolated by department and location. And that really needs to change if brands are going to compete effectively. 54% from our studies have shown that companies are not only increasing their spend on data and data-related services, but they're also focused on tracking that data across channels uh, to support customers. So for example, 46% said tracking online to offline was their focus. And 39% said for offline to online is critical. So this allows them, if they can do this, to power those experiences in the opposite channel in a physical versus digital format. So we like to think of data as the new oil. And it's important to follow its path digitally. If we look at data combined with a universal profile of a customer, brands can actually evolve to a design-driven transformation. Now, social media, content, personalization, and video advertising are literally all at the forefront of customer investments for this year. And if these areas are enabled by data, brands can actually deliver that customized content to a guest, and they can leverage segments, and they can leverage personas from first, second, and third-party data to make those experiences come to life. So we really do talk about data as the new oil. And if you're on board, you're going to be successful. Interesting. Interesting. I love that word, digital. That's a great word. <laughs> Squishing them together. Exactly. So what are the major digital trends in the travel and hospitality industry? So there are four major themes that we saw through our research. One, customer experience is regarded as the 
primary way for organizations to differentiate themselves from competitors, but data capabilities aren't developing fast enough. Two, design is the not-so-secret strategic weapon, and it has continued importance. Three, creating an experience-focused like company culture is helping to drive success. And then four, we're seeing that travel brands have moved beyond being mobile-ready, and now they want to understand the role that mobile plays in the buying and research process. So cross-channel consistency and journey management are at the forefront for this year based on our Adobe's research. Now, are there any new emerging technologies that are being adopted in the travel and hospitality industry? Absolutely. From our Adobe Digital Insights, we have a travel trends for 2017. What we're seeing is that new technology is actually on the rise. So social mentions for travel and augmented or virtual reality experiences has actually increased like 13% year over year. And most of these experiences are catered to VR devices paired with phones. We've seen eight major hotel chains have experimented with providing a VR experience it's just within the last six months. And we know that consumers are eager to interact with tech. So travel wearable mentions for, and social have increased 44%. There was a introduction by Princess Cruises this past Jan January of the Ocean Medallion. So we're seeing an uptick there. And then I think one of the most critical things, and you're going to start hearing more and more about this on the Futurescape, is that on the forefront of new tech is voice-enabled search. Now, you and I are, are speaking, right? And we can speak at 140 words per minute on average, probably faster if you live on the East Coast. <laughs> and you type at 40 words per minute, right? It's significantly less. So the accuracy today for voice search is only at 95%. When this actually reaches 99%, the travel channel is going to be completely disrupted. Just yesterday, Kayak was actually showcased for the first, being the first online travel player to offer booking of their hotels via Amazon Alexa. So we're already starting to see this happen. We also are seeing plans to integrate Alexa into Ford vehicles. Adobe's actually built a voice integration to Alexa. And right now, I don't think it's going to be long before you can actually do travel planning and booking in your car while you're stuck in traffic. Wow, that would be amazing. As somebody that travels quite a bit for work. Think about all the folks who are stuck in L.A. on the highway and all the travel planning that happens. It's really going to be a disruptor, and I think it's going to happen a lot sooner than people expect. Can you share? I'm curious. You work with, a, I'm sure, a number of clients, even your background in working in this industry. Can you share some examples of companies that are doing interesting things? I mean, Kayak, that's amazing what they're doing. Yeah, I have four great examples. So high level, digital marketing actually makes it possible to personalize each interaction at scale. Without it, you wouldn't be able to facilitate it, right? So a human connection is actually what drives lasting value, though. So listening more, understanding more, and then taking action on what you do know and sharing it with others. Qantas Airlines, for instance, gathers information on each one of its customers, their preferences, their flight history, and their frequent flyer data. It then takes that data and it shares that information with its flight attendants so then they can personalize each passenger's flight experience as much as possible in a positive way. Imagine that. Marriott Hotels has established a series of predictable data points for each of its guests to find ways to make their individual stay better. The data actually anticipates simple touches like how a guest takes their coffee or remembering they always arrive on a red eye and they can actually use an early check-in. Now, the data is starting to provide a brilliant use of functionality that didn't and couldn't exist before. Tourism Australia has actually mastered the science and art of attracting tourists to its site. I love this example. So while most companies look inward on how they can reflect their brand, Tourism Australia looked outward. They have a massive amount of content from customers that are hashtagged See Australia. And although they have a very small team, they were able to incorporate a live feed of authentic and beautiful posts with imagery. And this actually led them to have a 30% increase in site engagement and a 77% increase in leads, which is phenomenal, all by actually taking the customer's view and lens of See Australia. And my last and final example is Heathrow Airport. Now, Heathrow helps 75 million people each year reach their destination. It's actually one of Europe's busiest travel hubs. But on top of air travel, Heathrow actually operates trains to London, offers parking option, and has over 100 different retail and restaurant brands that they manage. Now, the services are managed by a variety of business units. But at the end of the day, the customer views Heathrow as one entity. And customers engage and expect Heathrow to know them. Why wouldn't they, right? They don't feel like there should be a disconnect. 
So Heathrow collects and analyzes data across all the touch points, and they reach around 6 million people monthly with personalized communications. The data helps them to determine what customers want, and then they leverage those insights from social to improve targeting and experiences. And then they use their analytics, and they view each of the individual customers and assess how they respond to the specific content. So it's not even just looking at the data in a broad stroke. They look at individuals and say, how did you respond to that specific content? Then they assess the content needs based on your online visits or your actual past visits to the airport. So looking at a digital version and the physical, right? The fidgetal, they bring that together. Their newest advanced features support geotargeting on mobile devices. So the customers, when they're actually in the airport, in the terminal, they can send them relevant offers and services nearby based on that past performance, whether it was online or offline. So four great examples of brands that I think that are taking data they're using it as the new oil, and they're expanding the customer experience to levels that are starting to surprise and delight, which I'm excited about because you're giving people their time back. No, yeah, those are fantastic examples. What curious if you've got any tips that you would suggest for marketers in the travel and hospitality industry? You've got a lot of stats and a lot of trends. Yeah. I do. I'm a data-driven marketer, absolutely. So, And as I said, data is the new oil. So if you learn what customers love, revenue will follow without wasted expense. That's the most critical. So this is where machine learning comes in and lookalike modeling. So let's say you know about 65% about a person and you could match them up based on their actions or interactions to a database where you know and understand 95% of an audience. Theoretically, you could apply what you know based on how they interact and then actually provide them with a better experience. You know, if you think about it, we live in this new mobility reality of customer interactions. It crosses multiple fragmented devices, operating systems with changing context. We're seeing that customers are multimodal, meaning the shift of who they are and what they're interested in is constantly in flux at any moment. So someone may travel on business and then extend their trip and include their family. Without data or a machine to look for these cues, like personalization can be a mess. No human being can follow all those cues to know that someone has shifted their travel mode and data helps to unify everything. I would get comfortable with data being the new oil and incorporate that into the entire framework of your teams. Nice. So I love to kind of step back and talk about the person I'm interviewing. And in that vein, I love this question that I ask a lot of times is, you know, what experience in your past do you think defines who you've become today? People always ask me how I got into customer experience, and it all started when I was eight years old. I watched my father as an early innovator. He was in college, and they approached him to move into studies to develop a blind rehabilitation program. He was one of four individuals, and then one dropped out, and he became one of three. So with a $35,000 grant, he set off with three other students to create a program that would open up the world to 350,000 blind individuals. He traveled to China, Japan, and Paris to build out their programs. And one day, myself and my two siblings, we left Kalamazoo, Michigan, where I grew up, and set off to Austin, Texas, in a Lincoln Continental Town Car with a complete set of eight-track tapes of ABBA nice. to spend the, <laughs> the summer in the Blind Rehabilitation Center, an actual Blind Rehabilitation Center. And I had the opportunity to experience living with blind patients firsthand. Now, he created a system of tools to help a specific population, so sight-impaired individuals, on how to navigate a sighted world through capabilities, right? Like walking with a cane, folding muddy, et cetera, to improve their life experience. And what he did is he opened up my eyes to expanding someone's world through innovation and proper navigation. And I think this has impacted me to this day when I do my work. How do you make someone's life better? How do you make the world better? I love that. That's a, such a fascinating experience to have at such an early age of eight years old. It was. A whole summer. <laughs> well, what continues to fuel your success and what drives you personally these days? So I'm actively interested in neuroscience and the future. So when you're born, you are intrinsically nonlinear, meaning you are not contained by any constraints of the world. Literally anything is possible. Over time, roughly around the age of eight, the majority of people become linear. And this is how, this is driven by kind of how information is parsed to someone as they grow. An example, so when I grew up, the phone was attached to the wall and you had to sit or stand next to its location. 
Think about that for a moment. Right. As a child, I asked my mom, like, why do we have to have this long court? Now, my mom, now also my dad, were both nonlinear, good or bad, but that's kind of created who I am today, right? But she said to me, that's how it is today, but in the future, it may change, which is the right answer. What we know today is only a reflection of today. Now, imagine, like, pause for a minute and think to yourself, what if she'd said to me, phones can only work if they're connected to the wall? What she would have done is created an artificial constraint in my mind. And as a child, my beliefs would have been solidified that things are only able to be the way they are today, right? There is no opportunity for change. But now we talk hands-free and through cars. It's crazy, right? <laughs> Think about it. So the correct answer always is that anything is possible. So it's these self-limiting beliefs of the brain that inhibits change or evolution, which I find interesting. And before joining Adobe, I was actually a customer since 2005. So I had the pleasure of being on their customer advisory board each year. And we would meet and discuss what happens to, you know, what the needs are for the future. What does that look like? And I looked forward to those discussions. And I was always thrilled with how Adobe continued to evolve based on client feedback. So I would get to come forward with a variety of my peers and talk about where do I think the world is changing and evolving to. So that was really exciting. And then today, as head of industry strategy for travel, I get to focus all of my attention on the best of both worlds with neuroscience and the future. Fascinating. So I know marketers are usually students of the business. And I'm curious, are there brands or companies or even causes that you think other people should be taking notice of? So there are many brands in travel that are evolving. And they're solving for challenges that have been out there for years from like sleep pods at airports to intuitive wayfinding through augmented reality or even thoughtful media solutions that consider like how do customers use and consume entertainment today? I think the brands that are the most interesting are rethinking who they are and what they can offer to a customer. So part of innovation is looking at what customers want and then envisioning what they can't even imagine. Like Ford said, if I've asked customers what they would have wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So a great example of this is Singapore Airport. Now they are building a new destination theme resort at the airport called Jewel. It gives a whole new meaning to an enhanced experience while you wait. It features a five-story indoor garden, hedge maze, bouncing canopy nets, an enormous waterfall, even indoor clouds. The tropical garden is going to be enclosed in a glass and steel structure, and it has a 131-foot waterfall called the Rain Vortex at its center. And it's going to transform into a light and sound show at night. So this is a $1.7 billion project, and it already adds to the airport's current list of attractions. So it already has a butterfly room. It has six gardens, video arcades, and a children's playground with rides. Wow. Think about that. If somebody said, well, what do I want out of my airport? Somebody would have said, you know, less lines. But now what they're doing is they're saying, you know what? We know you're going to be waiting. We know that there's places where you have missed flights and you're stuck somewhere. They're going to have a resort right there on site with attractions. They're really taking it to a new level. So brands like that. And then also inversely, just even listening to what your customers want. So great brands are listening to the customers and reaping rewards from that. McDonald's received about 120,000 tweets asking for breakfast throughout the day. Such a simple thing, if you think about it, right? Breakfast throughout, I want breakfast throughout the day, not just in the morning. So this info came from their social channels and it drove them to launch a test to offer all day breakfast options. This actually led to a 5.7% increase in sales and it pushed their franchisees to their highest level of cash flow since 2010. Wow just offering breakfast all day. Now I have a great personal example from my work on travel that I'd also like to share. I worked at Caesars Entertainment at the time, Paris, Las Vegas, if you may have seen it, is one of their brands. Now iconic in nature, you've seen it, yeah. okay, great. I've always been using data and I like to do things even manually if I have to. So I took the 55 star reviews from TripAdvisor back in like 2005 and I said, what do customers really care about? What's important to them? Dining, entertainment, nightlife, hotel, attractions. Have you been to Paris by any chance, Alan? I have. It's been a while, but I've, I've been, yeah. Okay. So what would you say would be your guess of what people cared about with Paris, Las Vegas? Why would they stay there? Oh, gosh. I think it gets back to basics for me would be options for eating. Options for eating. Yeah. Dining. Well, and, and dining is, is definitely one of the areas where, you know, people you know, expressed an interest. But the ironic thing, and why I, I love this example, is that the number one thing they cared about were found show views of Bellagio across the street. <laughs> oh, wow. 
wow. Okay. I was yeah. like, wow, all the stuff I own in my ecosystem for this brand is not what they care about. They care about the views from across the street. And I said, you know what? Maybe this is, you know, an unusual way of thinking about it, but let's take that. This is what customers care about. Let's bring that forward to them. So I put fountain show views into search copy at the time. And I think I had a million dollar campaign running with a thousand percent return on ad spend. I ended up increasing it by 25%. Our CEO at the time actually spoke about it at Focus Right and other travel conferences. And then we later on actually took fountains going off in front of the Bellagio, in front of Paris. So think of the view being completely occluded right by fountains going off. And we put it into our display media at the time and leveraged that. And we had the same success, another 25% or 22% increase in conversion rate just because customers, it resonated with them. So those are a few examples where I think that when you look about at brands or companies, one, it's the, the brands who are rethinking who they are and what they can offer. And then also the brands that are really, truly listening and hearing what is important and making those things come to life. Well, that's an amazing example. And leveraging the outside world, to your point, um, I would have never imagined that, to be honest. So interesting. So last question, you have to get your crystal ball out, although I think you're already there. Um, <laughs> what do you see as the future of marketing? What do you think marketing is going to look like in the future? No marketer can actually afford to be bogged down with tying multiple marketing solutions together. If you think about it, that's a lot of work for anyone to take on. The human brain can only consume about seven things, which is why phone numbers are what they are, and usually in chunks of three. That helps the brain to process, consume. It's, there's a little bit of processing fluency that becomes a part of that. So we're seeing this explosion of MarTech, but I would actually expect to see simplicity to follow. In the interim, more and more companies are hiring CMTs or chief marketing technologists. In fact, 66% of marketing teams have a CMT today, and about 26% are looking to fill these roles in the next 12 months. Data and analytics is going to play a crucial role on marketing teams. And teams are going to have to evolve for how they do their work over time. If you think about it, the existing roles that, it, that are in marketing teams today really are going to be shaken up. And people need to redo how they do their work from every process. And they need to get the ball down the line, but there has to be this extreme amount of communication, right? So to do anything at scale, process, people, and roles have to evolve. On the tech side, we're seeing open source and microservices are going to simplify systems and allow the marketers to become marketers again. I think that's probably one of the most critical things and one of the reasons I joined Adobe. I would sit on that customer advisory board each year and we would talk about the future and I said, let's build the matrix. Hook everything in, simplify it, and allow me to be strategic about marketing. And I think that companies and brands are getting there. At Adobe, we're, we're helping to bring that simplicity back through an enterprise system that can drive that experience business. And as I said you know, many times, data is a new oil. And what we've done, we've sought to do is to make sure that we know where the oil is and that it's connected to the pipeline and can be targeted as needed without all the work. So you will see that things will get more complex and then they will get more simple and systems and tools will be helping to facilitate that marketers can go back to being marketers. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And the more marketers I talk to are wrestling with that complexity right now and a future where it becomes simple and that they can really focus on the marketing aspects again, I think is, is brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been fascinating. Thank you, Alan. I really enjoyed it and look forward to hearing more about you know, the work you're doing in the future. Marketing Today is brought to you by Atomic. Atomic focuses on unleashing the growth potential for clients we serve. Atomic is a strategic consultancy specializing in business, marketing, brand, and innovation. Our singular goal is to help you accelerate your efforts with the right mix of expertise, analysis, and creativity. Check us out at atomic.com. A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with project management by Sarah Williams, audio production by Aaron Campbell, writing and editing by Kevin Greeley, social media support by Megan Woods, art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. We love to hear from listeners at info at atomic, A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. 
I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.